So even though I'm the first one to say that blood work is very important, you should do it frequently, ideally every month, blood work as many times as you can afford, it's just a moment in time. We're not treating the numbers. That's what old school endocrinologists do. They look at a number, it's off, and now they're bringing your exogenous testosterone dose down. Vigor, Steve here. So I get this question quite frequently. People want to know what the safest dose of exogenous testosterone is and find out the upper tolerable dose of exogenous testosterone so they can find some sort of middle ground and run testosterone for very long periods of time, preferably indefinitely with minimal side effects and all of the benefits associated with testosterone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy, or a full-blown steroid cycle that revolves around testosterone, right? Basically, people want to know the get out of jail for free testosterone dose. Long story short, it highly depends what else you're doing with your body, because let's be honest, you're not just taking exogenous testosterone, you might also be drinking or eating some processed foods over the weekends. Maybe smoke a cigar or some cigarettes or vaping or smoking weeds, taking some recreational drugs here and there, right? So whatever pressure you're putting on your body, not that I'm saying that exogenous testosterone is putting tremendous pressure on your body, but as the dose escalates, generally speaking, health parameters start to decline. So if you keep the dose moderate, I would say that testosterone is reasonably safe. But if you start ramping up the dosages to bodybuilder dosages, then uh, you definitely have to put some uh, practices in place to keep your health intact. But to simplify it even more, the best dose of testosterone for you as an individual is the dose where you get all of the benefits associated with exogenous testosterone, that's increased mood and well-being, increased libido, but not to the point you have uncontrollable libido, where you're fopping 24 seven and you can't get anything done and your penis is completely calloused over. Right? That dose is then way too high. You need to reel it back in a little bit. You get a positive aggression, increased motivation, more confidence, and what so many people in the fitness industry are after, increased muscle mass and improved body composition, right? You want all of the good stuff and none of the bad. And the only real way of figuring that out is through self-experimentation. So you're going to have to get your hands dirty and maybe experience some side effects along the way. Side effects like acne or oily skin, hair loss or hair growth in places you did not expect, like the chest, or the back or other places of the body. Maybe you get some symptoms of gynecomastia, as simple as puffy nipples or full-blown gyno if it's in your genetic makeup and your body fat levels are reasonably high at the start of exogenous testosterone treatments. You might get anger management issues becoming irritable at the smallest thing or full-blown roid rage. And in that sense, exogenous testosterone is very similar to alcohol. If you're already a dead and you start drinking, you become highly intoxicated. You're more of a dickhead, more of a troublemaker, and exogenous testosterone is very similar to that sense. Even though most people report that they feel absolutely fantastic, very mellow, very happy-go-lucky when they start supplementing. Your blood pressure might go up. You might have impaired sleep quality. Blood work parameters might change. All of which, take it from me, with lifestyle changes, over-the-counter supplements, or some ancillaries, many of these side effects, these commonly occurring side effects, can be mitigated or completely removed. To figure out what the ideal starting dose of exogenous testosterone is going to be for you as an individual, all you have to do is look into the medical field because exogenous testosterone is being used in various treatments, especially revolving around androgen deficiency. You might not be androgen deficient currently, but you still want to have the benefits of exogenous testosterone to improve your overall quality of life. So let's have a look into the medical field and see what the generally accepted prescription dosages of various exogenous testosterone products actually are. I'll put them on the screen. Testosterone undecanoate, testosterone enanthate, testosterone cypionate, testosterone propionate, testosterone suspension, even though I wouldn't recommend suspension in any way, shape or form, because the post-injection pain can be quite brutal. We have compounded ester formulas like Sustenon 250, and there's even alternative testosterone treatments in the form of mucoadhesive oral patches, transdermal fil films, transdermal solutions, transdermal gels, capsules, nasal sprays, implants. And to summarize, regardless of ester formulation, the general medical consensus is that in the treatment of androgen deficiency, injectable exogenous testosterone will range anywhere between 25 milligrams to 200 milligrams per week. So I would say that that's a reasonably safe starting point. You can always build up. Just keep in mind that these clinically accepted dosage ranges are regardless of age, diet, 
lifestyle, activity levels, the co-administration of other medications or ancillaries, or performance-enhancing drugs, and the amount of GAC repeaters that you have on your androgen receptor, because it's the amount of GAC repeaters that determine how tightly the exogenous testosterone is going to bind and potentiate androgen-mediated gene transcription, which is ultimately where all of the beneficial effects from the exogenous testosterone are going to come from. Now, if you're curious about these androgen receptor GAC repeats without turning it into a full-blown GAC repeat deep dive, GAC stands for cytosine adenine guanine. And in most humans, the amount of GAC repeats on the androgen receptor can vary between 18 to 24 repeats, whereas in some humans have up to 35 GAC repeats, but it highly depends on the individual genetic polymorphism. Most of the scientific evidence indicates that fewer GAC repeats leads to increased androgen receptor sensitivity and binding to androgens. And whether that's a free circulating testosterone or other exogenous anabolic androgenic steroids, which are testosterone derivatives, fewer GAC repeats results in a tightly bound androgen to the androgen receptor, and thus you get more of an effect on the gene transcription. And on the other side, more GAC repeats leads to decreased receptor sensitivity and binding. And this is where medical conditions like androgen insensitivity syndrome are stemming from. Now, that being said, it seems that genetic analysis for androgen receptor GAC repeats isn't included in most DNA testing services that you can find online. So let's just forego these GAC repeats and stick to the things we can actually measure. So now that we know the clinical dosage ranges, how can we determine the best response to this dose of exogenous testosterone that we're taking? We can go with blood work as the first line of acquiring some data on what's going on internally. Now, of course, I'll be the first one to say that blood work is not going to tell you how tightly the testosterone is binding to the androgen receptor with a certain amount of GAC repeats. We can't figure it out, but blood work can tell you how a testosterone is metabolizing into diuretic testosterone or estradiol and how it's affecting your overall blood work parameters. Blood work is just a moment in time. When you're going for blood work, you draw blood. All the numbers that you get on paper on your blood work results are just of the blood that was drawn at that exact moment in time. So even though I'm the first one to say that blood work is very important, you should do it frequently, ideally every month, blood work as many times as you can afford, it's just a moment in time. We're not treating the numbers. That's what old school endocrinologists do. They look at a number, it's off, and now they're bringing your exogenous testosterone dose down, right? We're treating the patient, we're treating you. We need to figure out how you feel, right? So before you go in for blood work, make a little diary, write down what your mood is, what your libido is, what your well-being is, what your motivation and confidence, aggression, et cetera is, right? Rate that from a one star to five star. Make some assumptions, form a hypothesis. Maybe you think that your estradiol levels are high or your dihydrated testosterone levels are high based on the hair loss or symptoms of gynecomastia that you're currently experiencing, right? Whatever side effect you have, try to mix and match that to particular blood work parameters, Write it down first, bro, please go on for blood work to confirm it. Was your hypothesis correct? Or maybe your estradiol levels are just slightly elevated and the gyno that you're experiencing is just water retention, right? Your prolactin is in a range, your progesterone levels are normal. If you can't figure it out, right, hire a coach or hire somebody who can interpret your blood work results for you. But it's very important as for you as a beginner trying to figure out what the best dose of exogenous testosterone is to write down your assumptions and how you feel before you go in for blood work and then you put two and two together. Just keep in mind that not all blood work results are created equally. The results might vary between 10 to 20% among the different testing methods. 